While most teachers might rejoice when great crowds followed them, Jesus was different. He knew the mixed motives of the human heart and what a fickle audience he had at any given time. So here is a very unusual teacher. His parables test rather than illuminate. And more importantly, they test not intelligence, but spiritual responsiveness. Notice Jesus's closing challenge in verse nine. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Now, I wonder if that sounds uh, familiar. Jesus said the same thing to each of the seven churches in Revelation. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Remember also how John starts Revelation in chapter one, verse three. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it. So here in Mark chapter four, Jesus is teaching about the kingdom of God and his message is to those who have ears to hear. In other words, those people who hear and act upon the message. And we can see then how this parable follows on very clearly from the last section, looking at the different responses to Jesus and his message. The parable itself is simple. A farmer goes out and scatters his seed upon the ground. Much of the seed falls on unsuitable ground and never becomes crop bearing or fruitful. Only some of the seed succeeds. The explanation of this parable then comes in verses 14 to 20, but notice this is only to Jesus's disciples, not to the whole crowd. So the first seed never finds root, and here Jesus warns against this misguided notion that hearing equals believing. Satan takes away the seed that was sown, so it's as if those people had never heard the gospel in the first place. Now, Satan doesn't make the hearer literally forget what they've heard, but rather he can persuade that person that what they heard was implausible uh, or open to interpretation, uh, or maybe a message that was not important enough to respond to. The second seed did well for a time, but it represents a short-lived euphoria. Anyone who's worked in sales will relate to this. You make your sales pitch and some prospective buyers get really excited. Sounds great, amazing product, count me in. But after a while, their enthusiasm wanes and they decide uh, not to buy. Now, plenty of people would be happy to hear what the disciples had to say, but their joy would be short-lived, especially when trouble or hardship came along. And this is an important point because Jesus is telling the disciples what to expect in their own life as they go about preaching the gospel. Those who abandoned the faith at the first sign of trouble were never truly people of faith. The third seed responds in a similar way to the second seed. This time it's the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires for other things that come in and choke the word. Now, how common this is today. So many people professing themselves to be Christians are choked by worldly concerns and distractions. They cannot possibly commit to the work of ministry because they're pursuing an important career, renovating the house or maybe focusing on their family. Now, none of those things are problematic in themselves, but Jesus speaks of a state in which those things engulf 
our lives. They choke the life out of our faith so that our faith becomes fruitless. Now, at this point, we need to beware. In describing these different types of ground, Jesus is not describing different kinds of faith. Clearly, he holds up the final seed as true faith, that which produces fruit for the kingdom of God. And John emphasizes this in chapter 15 of his gospel and verses four to eight. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So Jesus gives the meaning of this parable to his disciples. Well, why didn't he just spell out what he meant to the whole crowd? Many Christians believe that the gospel is so clear and obvious, everyone should be able to grasp it. But Jesus takes a different view. Take a look at this clip from the classic 12 Angry Men. The background, uh, the jury are deliberating on the guilt of a young man accused of murder. And on their preliminary vote, there are 11 votes for guilty and only one for not guilty. After some heated discussion, they take a second vote and the balance shifts again. Thank you. This gentleman has been standing alone against us. Now, he doesn't say the boy is not guilty. He just isn't sure. Well, it's not easy to stand alone against the ridicule of others. So he gambled for support, and I gave it to him. I respect his motives. But the boy in trial is probably guilty, but uh, I want to hear more. Right now, the vote is 10 to 2. I'm talking here. You have no right to leave this yeah, room. I hear you. You never will. Let's sit down. Juror number seven walks out not because he can't hear what the old man has to say, but because he won't hear. 12 Angry Men is not so much a film about the American justice system, it's about the human heart. Each of these jurors has their own personal reason for wanting this young man convicted of murder, and the facts of the case are less important than their own desires, their own personal preferences. In the same way, the crowds here in Mark's Gospel aren't too interested in what Jesus has to say. But here's the thing, rather than simply not preach at all, Jesus codes his message. And that's the key to understanding verse 12. Jesus isn't trying to conceal the truth from them. It's more the case that their own hearts are too stubborn to understand. Now, the disciples didn't understand the parable either, but Jesus revealed it to them. And there are reasons for that. Firstly, they demonstrated a willingness to follow and listen to their master, which we noted last week. But secondly, they were also to be preachers of this gospel, as we saw in chapter 3, verse 14. Jesus appointed the twelve that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. So here's the important thing to note. Having commissioned the disciples as preachers of the gospel, they needed to understand how their preaching would be received. There would always be crowds, but few would respond appropriately to the gospel. The parable of the sower was initially instructive to the disciples to set their expectations as they went out to preach. But today the parable serves as a kind of checklist of spirituality. How do we respond to the word of God in our own lives? Passively maybe, with little to no interest. Maybe with an enthusiasm which quickly withers away by Monday morning 
or maybe with their lack of grounding, allowing worldly cares to come in and choke us. Or maybe we respond fruitfully. Now remember that fruitfulness is not simply about works. It is much more about godly character, faithfulness, and above all, love. Let he or she who has ears to hear, let them hear.